some countries, including those from South Africa and Nigeria, echoed Xi's speech. They vowed to increase solidarity, uphold multilateralism, strengthen belt and road cooperation, and accelerate follow-ups to the foreign and China-Africa cooperation Beijing summit. They also say they are determined to uphold the UN-centered global governance system and support the WHO in making greater contributions to the global COVID-19 response. I am convinced that humanity will ultimately defeat the virus and that the Chinese and African people are poised to embrace better days ahead. A joint communique was released after the summit, vowing to take China and Africa's comprehensive, strategic and cooperative partnership to greater heights. And it calls for more efforts to mobilize the necessary resources and do whatever it takes to protect people's lives and health and minimize the fallout of COVID-19. Zheng Yibing, CGTN, Beijing. And to help us unpack this week's developments from the extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19 is Professor Fu Jun. He's the Academic Dean at the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development at Peking University. Welcome, Professor, to this discussion, and thank you for joining us on Talk Africa. Now, this week, President Xi Jinping and African leaders held an extraordinary uh, summit on solidarity uh, together, China and Africa. President Xi Jinping described the virtual session as taking place at a critical moment in the global fight against the pandemic. Professor, what is your understanding of the significance of this summit coming at this time? Well, you know, this is so important because uh, COVID-19 is not a disease against one country. It's a disease against all countries. Uh, the world is very connected. And if uh, there is one country left uh, without being triumphant in fighting the disease, all countries will be affected. So this is so important uh, for us to join hands together. And uh, when you compare developed and developing countries, even though you consider a time gap uh, for the spread of the disease, eventually uh, less developed countries will be more vulnerable. And unless those vulnerable, less uh, prepared countries uh, finally beat the disease, uh, uh, we cannot say that we are uh, here uh, in China uh, beat the disease. So it is so important for us to uh, strengthen, uh, to strengthen the cooperation between China and uh, Africa countries. And for that matter, to strengthen cooperation uh, with the countries all over the world to fight the disease. There were a lot of measures that were announced by President Xi Jinping to assist Africa. And one of the issues uh, that came out was the speeding up of the setting up of the African CDC. Uh, and that will be fast tracked to be set up this year. How do you see the, this though improving Africa's response to the pandemic or African responses to future epidemics? Well, this is a very cr critical if we look at the Chinese experience of uh, uh, crisis uh, management. And if I look at the case of SARS uh, that took place uh, in uh, 2003, and it is so critical to set up uh, an uh, institutional uh, arrangement that we call CDC, uh, because uh, when you deal with the public health crisis, basically you have to deal with the, what we call uh, either black swans or gray rhinos. Uh, we are facing uh, threats, and it is so important for us to have uh, institutions set up like uh, CDC uh, to be there, to be technically, organizationally prepared uh, in terms of uh, surveillance, in terms of uh, information, to recognize that a threat is coming so that we are in the better position to fight uh, those uh, public and the global uh, epidemics. Uh, now, CDC will be in the very front line. And to contain those diseases, uh, the expediency and the readiness in terms of information, uh, technical information, scientific information, is so critical. This is sort of the first uh, move. Then you will consider, is the system ready? in terms of uh, strategic reserve, then is the system uh, ready in terms of response, and ultimately will the system be ready in terms of uh, recovery. So when you see those uh, phases of crisis uh, management, 
CDC is so critical. Right. Let's look at the issue of multilateralism, Professor Fujun, because uh, there was a strong uh, call for uh, protection of multilateralism. Now, the world is undergoing profound changes, unseen in a century. What opportunities and challenges do Africa and China face? And why do these more than ever before call for cooperation between China and Africa? Well, when under great stresses of uh, uh, pressure, and there is a tend to be a uh, tendency for uh, some to uh, go uh, alone, but uh, I think it's a uh, nearsighted uh, uh, approach. Ultimately, it is through win-win scenarios uh, that we can deal with uh, common threats like the disease better, and in the context of that, it is very critical to emphasize multilateralism rather than unilateralism. And the unilateralism, given the nature of the disease, uh, won't beat the disease anyway. So at this moment, uh, it makes sense uh, to uh, remind people that multilateralism is the way to go to fight a disease of the nature of uh, COVID-19. This is a disease against the whole mankind. And another way of saying is uh, to fight a disease against the whole mankind is multilateralism. That's the way I see it. Well, how do you see China and Africa, though, working together to uphold multilateralism and defend the UN-centered global governance system into the future? Well, China uh, is an emerging economy, and now when you look at its, uh, the size of GDP, uh, it's number two. But when you multiply that size by uh, the size of the population, GDP per capita continue to be low. We are somewhere a little bit below average uh, in uh, that aspect. But being a big country, China has the responsibility to uh, maintain this uh, global system. And in that context, it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, strength, to emphasize multilateralism. And China, by the way, now can serve as a bridge uh, between the advanced part of the world and the less advanced part of the world because of the size of our economy. And for, if you just look at uh, GDP per capita uh, of a small country, you compare that with China, the similar level, probably a small country, a smaller country cannot play that role. Given the size of China, China is in the position to play that role. And that role means uh, uh, connecting uh, different parts of the world. And uh, here, uh, a big part of that picture is uh, to connect China with uh, uh, your continent. And this is a very uh, critical role for China to play. So if China has the responsibility, the greatest responsibility, a great responsibility in the global system, uh, how do you see going forward now? How, what kind of critical role do you see China playing in the future in, in terms of uh, its role in the global system? Well, I guess in the future, uh, the role that China should play should be uh, consistent with the role that it has been a play. In this moment, uh, SARS is sort of came like a uh, black swan, and it's very disruptive. But then I hope if we get over with that in the short or the medium term, uh, then uh, China should, going back to the normal, the, the normal means that we should continue to play a bridge uh, linking the advanced part of the world and the less advanced part of the world so that uh, the world economy is in a better place uh, to move forward. Now, for the time being, you see a lot of uh, negative growth in a way. It's non-growth and even negative growth. And China, uh, fortunately, continued to score positive growth, even though our growth rates has also been uh, dropped very dramatically. And as I said, I hope that we we'll can get over with that uh, by strengthening solidarity, and then we'll go back uh, to the normal. Normal means uh, we are all together and we should grow uh, the world economy so that uh, the prospects uh, for the increased welfare of uh, uh, mankind will be improved.
So undoubtedly, though, the, um, uh, the COVID-19 has dealt a, a, a massive impact on the economies of both China uh, and, and, and African countries. So what can China and Africa do, though, together to revive their economies? Uh, well, it's uh, not revive or not revive. You have to deal with that very cautiously, and you have to sort of... Uh, move forward a little bit in terms of uh, doing the economy, but at the same time, you need to watch out very carefully with the, uh, the credible information coming from organizations like CDC. And uh, uh, in a way, you have to be very resilient. Once you are too aggressive on the economic side, you probably need to come back a little bit. For instance, uh, now here in Beijing, uh, well, it seems uh, we have more cases now, but fortunately, because of uh, the credible information, scientific information we had in this case, uh, we moved much more rapidly uh, than before. And hopefully we contain that uh, in a timely uh, fashion. And that gives uh, the economy a better chance to recover. So it is really uh, a very cautious move of moving forward. And hopefully we strike a good balance between the two fronts. One is uh, the front of fighting the disease the other is the front of uh, growing the economy. And then I guess that logic will apply to other parts of the world. And since the world is so interconnected, you are talking about uh, uh, the chains of global production, and we are connected. So to reach out to your part of the world, also help uh, the Chinese economy to grow. And the Chinese economy, for Chinese economy to grow, it also helps for your part of the world to grow as well. So we are connected. We should uh, strength, strengthen our uh, solidarity. So, uh, uh, Professor Fujun, this summit uh, was a great show of solidarity between China and Africa, particularly at this time um, of the uh, pandemic. How do you see the evolution of Chinese and uh, China and Africa partnership going forward in terms of health cooperation, politically and economically? Uh, I tend to see, I do not sort of uh, separate politics and economics. The way I look at uh, politics and economy is uh, it's a political economy uh, uh, system, you know. Uh, the way that we have to apply for visas to travel means the politics is there. After all, it's not just uh, one village, so you can travel uh, freely. Somehow, nation states will have their own interests to take care of. But given that, can we move freer so that we increase the chance for uh, the movements of production to going around the world so that we increase uh, the level of efficiency so that we produce uh, better goods with uh, uh, fewer resources? And uh, that's the way uh, to go. And uh, to do that, ultimately, it's a game of uh, uh, political economy. And the, the logic is uh, uh, there. And hopefully, uh, we can uh, create all sorts of win-win uh, uh, scenarios uh, for every part in for every parts of the world, so that we increase the welfare of mankind, as I said, we are interconnected. All right, indeed. Professor Fujun, thank you very much for your insights today on uh, Talk Africa. That is Professor Fujun, the academic dean at the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development at Peking University. We'll take a short break now, but do stay tuned. Talk Africa continues in a moment. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference.
Well, joining us to expound on the significance of Africa's health cooperation with China in the fight against COVID-19 is Dr. James Ogutu, a microbiologist at the Kenyatta University School of Medicine in Nairobi. Dr. Ogutu, thank you for joining us on the program. I want to start by looking at the uh, virtual session that uh, took place this week, the summit that took place between uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping and uh, African leaders. Chinese President Xi Jinping described it as a historic virtual session taking place at a critical moment in the global fight against the pandemic. How critical is the fight against COVID-19 for Africa and how critical is the partnership between China and Africa in fighting the pandemic for the continent? Thank you so much, Beatrice Marshall, uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts. I think... Uh, the fight against uh, COVID-19 pandemic is a very critical fight, not only for Africa, but for the world. As you have seen, the numbers have consistently been rising. And in the case of Africa, you could see for our own uh, country, Kenya, the numbers uh, of confirmed cases, the numbers of deaths are actually rising. So. It would be very important if we could have our concerted efforts uh, focused uh, in the fight, focused to the fight against COVID-19. So it's a very critical time for us. Although our numbers are not as high as we see down south in Africa, in South Africa, our numbers are consistently rising. So that is something to worry about. So this fight should consistently continue and getting partners to help us fight is a step in the right direction. So let's look at that partnership, Dr. Ogutu, because a number of measures were announced by uh, President Xi Jinping, and, and a, a lot of financial support was also announced by the president. So in which areas do you think resources that China is making available should be channeled to Africa? In which areas do you think Africa needs those resources in? I think, number one, uh, we need to get the real picture of the extent of the pandemic in Africa. And to get that picture, we need testing, mass testing. So I think uh, one of the most important uh, aspects to look at with any kind of uh, help or assistance from our partners would be about testing, to get the testing kits to... Uh, all uh, counties, like for instance in Kenya, get the testing kits everywhere in uh, sufficient numbers so that testing uh, is not a problem anymore. But apart from that, we also need uh, uh, the government uh, and the partners to look at those who are infected. Some of the people who are infected are uh, not very well off, not very well to do. And so bearing the costs of testing and uh, costs of hospitalization is something that needs to be taken care of. But apart from that, we also have our frontline uh, workers in the healthcare sector, uh, the doctors. Uh, their protection is very, very important. So it is also important that some of that money could go to uh, what you call as the personal protective equipment the protective gears for the doctors that handle uh, the patients in the hospital. So those three, I think for me, are very, very key areas that we need to look at. So China also announced the fast tracking of an African CDC uh, uh, this year. How important is an Africa Center for Disease Control for Africa, and how important will this be in stemming a future uh, epidemics or improving Africa's response to epidemics? I think uh, one of the areas or one of the institutions within China that uh, was very, very effective in stemming up uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19 in China was the Chinese uh, CDC. And uh, it was very, very instrumental, especially in contact tracing. And I think an equivalent of that in Kenya to do the contact tracing would be very important. But 
You must also know that uh, Centers for Disease Prevention and Control go uh, uh, do much, much more than contact tracing. Uh, there are centers that are basically are the places or the institutions where research is done. So this will enhance the research capacity. This research capacity would be very useful in actually uh, studying and researching on the emerging infectious diseases. You know that COVID-19 is an emerging infectious disease. Or, and uh, apart from that, you also know that uh, when we have these centers for disease prevention and control in Africa, they'd be very, very useful for uh, infectious disease surveillance. So the surveillance aspect would be very helpful in trying to prevent uh, uh, future infections. All right. So one other key issue that um, came up was President Xi's uh, commitment to give Africa a priority as a beneficiary once a vaccine is uh, available and ready for deployment. If this does eventually happen, of course, many will be asking, how do you see this changing uh, the fight against uh, COVID-19? How do you see this changing this difficult COVID-19 challenge for Africa? It is significant that the president of China is talking about, uh, is considering seriously uh, the development of a vaccine uh, against COVID-19. As you may know that for us to prevent infections and to prevent the spread, we need to boost our immunity and a vaccine does precisely that. So uh, the race against development of uh, a vaccine that will be effective against COVID-19 is a welcome news. And uh, we know today that it is not only China that is working on the same. The Chinese are working on the same and considering it very seriously. The Americans are doing uh, 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 something towards the same. And we also know that in Europe, a lot of efforts are being made towards coming up with a, a vaccine against COVID-19. This vaccine would be very useful. You know that vaccination and immunization in the past has been very useful in uh, controlling, preventing, and even eradicating infections. We are almost uh, kicking polio out of the world because of vaccination. Smallpox has already been kicked out of the world because of vaccination. Likewise, it is also uh, believed that although it may not be possible to kick out COVID-19 and coronavirus infections because of other factors like uh, the, the, the different strains that exist, and the variations in their in their genomes and so on and so forth, but it would it would be very useful in helping to uh, control the disease. So, what do you expect uh, to see uh, moving forward before this vaccine is de is deployed in Africa, whether it is from China, from the USA, or from uh, Africa's efforts? What do you expect to see before this vaccine is deployed in Africa? Beatrice, just two words. I would expect due diligence. I would expect that any partner that is bringing a vaccine to Africa and to Kenya for that matter would make sure that the clinical trials have already been done in their countries of origin. And I would also expect that the receiving or the recipient countries would do due diligence in testing uh, the efficiency of the vaccine but apart from that, also making sure that the vaccine does not bring any health risk to anybody who is going to receive it. So due diligence would be one of the most important things, both for those uh, that are going to uh, assist, the partners that are going to help uh, with the development, as well as the recipient countries. So you have talked, uh, Dr. Ogutu, you've said uh, partnerships at this point, at this critical juncture when Africa is battling COVID-19 is very welcome. Moving forward, how do you see the evolution of this partnership between China and Africa, particularly in the area of health cooperation? Actually, it is very important to note that uh, in the recent past, uh, the relationship between uh, China and the African continent has been very warm. Uh, for your own information, if 
you may wish to know, Africa, uh, Chi China is already receiving a lot of students, postgraduate students, that are actually studying in Chinese uh, universities, institutes, and uh, uh, institutions. And many of them are in either biomedical science research, some are in engineering, the rest are also in uh, uh, studying medicine. So I'm, I'm seeing this partnership between China uh, and Africa actually getting better in the future. All right, uh, Dr. Ogutu joining us there via Skype from Nairobi. Thank you very much for your insight. Well, that is all we have time for this week. A big thank you to Dr. James Ogutu for sharing your thoughts, as well as Professor Fu Jun earlier on in the program. And thank you too for tuning in to this episode of Talk Africa. I would love to hear your feedback on this topic through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. And you can also catch this and more episodes of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist and the CGTN Africa website. We'll keep the conversation going and tune in again next week. From me, Beatrice Marshall, it's goodbye.